This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I like to see people's face in it because tonight um, this is very honored invite me here to meet all of you. So I like to see everybody's face when I talk. And also, every time, wherever I go to speak, and I meet wonderful, warm heart and big heart people. And tonight also, another reason I'm very happy to hear because I meet the wonderful people. And instant friend, I feel everybody, my friend, and I'm sure they take me in as a friend. Thank you. <laughs> if I tell them my story, I make a book. So I have to make a very short, only 10 minutes I have. So <laughs> uh, as you know, 1945, August 6th, and at that time, I was 13 years old, in junior high, the first year. And that particular morning, day, uh, a student have to go out to the, to the city, not in uh, studying in the school, to the help the uh, city people to, to clean up the breaking down uh, houses. And uh, <clears throat> that day was the first time my school got out. Then just going to start to work, I heard the airplane. And I look up the sky. In that morning it was such a beautiful blue sky. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, no crowd. Then uh, I saw the silver shining plane and white tail and blue sky, it looks beautiful. And then in those times, the big city in Tokyo, Osaka, those big city uh, having a, a firebomb, a lot of a firebomb, but Hiroshima wasn't. So I wasn't afraid that the airplane because no bomb drop, they come and goes. And that's why I was looking up. And then also I told my classmate next to me, look up the sky and put it play. Then almost same time, I pointed the sky. And then I saw the airplane dropped something white. And later I find out that was the parachute to the bring down on the plane or something. But anyway, uh, 
than a nut play in a bomb, I mean. <laughs> then everything at once, to me, very strong forces. And uh, if I say air, uh, the wind, uh, that's not enough. The very strong things I felt the knock my back, me down. Then I don't know how long I was unconscious. Then when I start sitting up and I look around, black, that I don't see anything, pitch black, just like this. Then I didn't hear anything. I didn't feel anything. Then all the sun, and I can see the, the blackness go away more like a fog go away in a clearly to see more. And uh, probably I was unconscious a long time because at that time already people moving out from the center, from the bomb on drop to, to the out of the city. So I just followed the people. But when I saw that the people, wasn't like a normal regular when before the bomb dropped. And the, the, most of the ch uh, students was working on it, and the teachers. But when the people moving, uh, very difficult to explain the uh, many, many people um, hurt. No one in the unfurred people, everybody get hurt, some are bleeding, some are uh, burned and it's scar coming off. And scar coming off, skin, I mean, coming off means body is a pink. And I, I look around and there are many people's the face and the bodies and the pink and then some clothes are hanging down and those people are next to each other, very slowly moving. It's still same thing. I didn't hear anything, and then I even didn't know myself was like that. I just followed all the people, and the nearby to the river there. By the time I went to the river, and stay away, and people pushing each other to go down, and I didn't want to go in the water, but because so many people already in the water, and the many of the thrashing uh, way to the uh, ocean, probably. And, and also, how did they see water? That much people in the water. And then it's still not the time I didn't feel. And then all of a sudden I heard the baby screaming. And I looked down. Every time that moment, if I think about it, it's very hard to talk. The mother is hurt. And breathing, and and also the baby, and mother tried to nurse baby. Baby couldn't, just screaming. And this is not just one of that. So many, so many people. All then all, all of a sudden, somebody said, "Go over the bridges. Go other side of the river because the." Airplane might come back. See, all the time people thought that's a firebomb. So I didn't know that the time entire Hiroshima city was damaged. So I followed the people to the about 1.5 kilometer away from that river to the other side. Uh, houses were not exactly flat, but uh, broken houses, but still uh, many people started helping uh, people. And then I went to <coughs> elementary school. Then I saw the Japanese soldiers helping uh, people. So I thought, oh, this is a place I should come. And then I sat down under the tree 
and lie in the back. That much I saw that day. After that, I didn't see any more anything because my face swelling. I stayed at the elementary school five days and four nights. Then a miracle happened. I was trying to tell my name and the address, and uh, may I have a water? The three things saying, and one more time I said, somebody pay attention. One more time, I push the effort. And then finally, a man heard, and then he went to my parents' house, which close to the city, many uh, far away, many miles away. I don't know how long uh, far away, but anyway, cross the other side. Then, very fortunately, my mother and father were in the city, but uh, 1.5 kilometer away from the uh, center of the bone exposed. Uh, my father was uh, also, same thing outside, the saw the airplane, same thing. And then she, he ran into the neighbors next to the big building. So he was sort of under the uh, house, so it didn't hurt much, just bruise. And my mother was the house, and the same thing, thrown into the different rooms, so she wasn't not much hurt. The, then also the houses was broken, one house broken and burned, and the other house, my father had the two houses. That house was the tipped and it survived. That's why the samba and the men came to the, my place and told, so they came to pick me up. So I stayed five days, four nights, no medication, no water, nothing. And I was unconscious and back and forth, and back and forth. Then, many months, no doctors, no medications. So my father and mother, what they did, did is uh, cooking oil, soybean oil, any kind the material, turn the salt to the wash down my face. I asked my mother, how did you find it? How I looked when you find it? Oh, and long, long, many, many years, she never told me, but finally I begged so much. So he, she told me when it, they heard it came to pick me up, she, of course they are calling my name. She heard a very, very weak, very small voice. Here I am. They're calling it Shigeko, Shigeko, and here I am. So they hear that sound to follow. Then looked, she couldn't recognize me because no face. My face was uh, sort of a uh, big basketball. And all black, and my hair was black and burned, and couldn't tell where the where the front or the back. And so they took me home. The first things my father did was cut to my hair. See that my head is not burned; only only the face is showing place. <coughs> Then that blackness is sort of a, when you make a toast, forget, and the smoke can come out and pop it up. It was so black and rough like this. I couldn't eat edible. So my face, the whole things are like that. And no eyes, no nose, no mouth. And so the, he cut the, my face side and the burned part of it and peel out. I'm sorry you're going to eat this kind of horrible talk. talk. 
I wanted the people to know what happened exactly, truly. So please forgive me talking like this. Is it okay? Yes. Thank you. And uh, he peeled the, the blackness out, and underneath was thick yellow puff, which infection. So they have to wash it down to the soybean oil to the clean up. And my mother tried to my open eye, my mouth, and the nose. And so and in Japan, in the summertime, they had a mosquito net, the corner to corner, and put the net. So the, fortunately, they had one. So I was under the mosquito net. So that's why I didn't get to the Ujimushi or not in the sense. Maggot, maggot, that's right. I forgot about I'm sorry, you know, I forget so easy. I didn't get a maggot, thank God. But while I'm lying down on bed, many people come to see me, how is Shigeko doing and things. And my mother have to listen to my breathing. Oh, she's still breathing. She's still alive. And then they are talking. I can hear just a horrible story they are talking. And shortly after the Hiroshima city was a hell, people come, out, come into the city to look for the relatives, the friends. Those people are talking. They cannot walk normally. They have to cover the handkerchief, the nose, the mouth. Smells so bad because people are burning and wounded people and so many maggots and flies. And people have to walk like this to the flies. And the, their back is black because the flies stacked. When I heard, my God, you know, what's going on? And then finally, finally uh, I, if I t tell you when I heard the many stories where the adult people talking about, one thing I have to tell you, this is, I will never forget. My, my, good, my mother's friend saying, uh, you, your daughter is hurt, but you find her, she survived. And my daughter was under the house, half of it buried the house, kind of pour out. And she's completely alive. And then she had other two children. Then fire coming in, smoke coming in. And the daughter said, Mom, you have to run away. She doesn't want it because the daughter is not dead. She tried pour her out to take things out, but no one can help, everybody hurt. And, and then she wants to stay, and then the daughter said, mother have to go, otherwise the two, other two kids will stay. So she feel touching, doesn't want to go, have to go, and then goodbye. And see, she's not dead, living in. And this is not just one story. Many people, living in, inside the building, and they couldn't come out asking help. But some people can't help. And uh, <clears throat> those people feel guilty. They're talking to my parents. I couldn't help. See, once war started, not only soldiers die and suffer. I know soldiers say many people suffered during the war time. But people who is a civilian, innocent people, many, many, not just Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the suffering during the war time. I feel. Hibakusha, 
as you know, Hibakusha means survive the uh, hit, uh, atomic bomb, or not just atomic bomb, uh, atomic energy. Uh, those people, uh, many all over the world. And uh, I feel those people have to get together, stand up, then tell their experience, then people to understand how horrible it is nuclear energy. Not just atomic bombs, nuclear energy towers and things uh, thanks to ex-mayor Hiroshima. Uh, he's working a wonderful job. Yeah, I'm so proud of him. See, this is the important people's life. It, and uh, people should be, be happy and no worry about the nuclear energies. And also I feel natural cause, like uh, tornadoes and, and uh, earthquake and tsunami, many people die natural cause, but most most of the people's life lose is war. And war is people mix. So we stop the, the survivors of many peoples. And then especially, I love children, I love babies. And ever since I saw that baby that day, oh God, I just can't take it these people's future. So that I feel everybody's responsibility, as you people know, so I know uh, all these people, you people are uh, same, same feeling what I feel about uh, their life, right? That's why you people here, they're working very hard. <laughs> That's another reason I, I'm very happy to meet you, all of you. Thank you so much. I, I want to tell you many things, but uh, I don't have a time. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you to listen to my speech. Thank you. Our goal tonight is to shine a light on peace leadership. We hope that each of you will be inspired, and particularly the students who are with us. Our, our goal for you, students, is that each of you will become a peace leader and take action on this most important of causes that will affect your future all of our futures, but your future more than some of us. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. We were founded in 1982. This is our 29th year and our 28th annual Evening for Peace. Our mission is to educate and advocate for peace and a world free of nuclear weapons and to empower peace leaders. We have many action-oriented programs, including a great action alert network and a very engaged peace leadership program. You heard a little about that program earlier from Paul Chappell. Our membership at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is now approaching 50,000 people. We have 2,500 people signed up for our peace leadership program. 
our websites, wagingpeace.org and nuclearfiles.org, uh, have 600,000 unique visitors annually. Our Action Alert Network has sent some 70,000 messages to political leaders uh, this year, and we're having some really uh, good success recently in getting the messages through to political leaders and making some change. Uh, we network with like-minded organizations around the world, including Mayors for Peace. Uh, this year, we've had 12 outstanding interns that have worked with us and been an integral part of our programs. This year, we've also had three conferences. Uh, earlier in the year, we had a conference in Santa Barbara on the dangers of nuclear deterrence. And out of that conference came a Santa Barbara declaration, reject nuclear deterrence, an urgent call to action. We explored many of the myths that are connected with deterrence and many of its flaws and came up with this declaration, which was introduced uh, later this year into the congressional record by our representative Lois Capps. Uh, we also had a conference uh, at the United Nations in Geneva on, uh, with diplomats uh, gathered there on um, lowering the alert status of nuclear weapons. Hard to believe, but now 20 years past the end of the Cold War, there are still some 2,000 nuclear weapons that remain on hair trigger alert. We think it's time to end that. We worked, with, we worked with the government of Switzerland on that conference, and then we had another conference at the United Nations in Geneva, working with the government of Kazakhstan, and that one was about bringing the comprehensive nuclear test ban into force. That treaty, that very, very significant treaty that would stop nuclear testing altogether and forever, uh, was signed by President Clinton in 1996, the Senate uh, turned down ratification in 1999, and for 15 years since that treaty was signed until today, it has not been ratified by the United States, and that ratification is necessary to show leadership if we're ever going to bring that treaty into force. In all our work at the Foundation, we've taken strength from the courage and the perseverance of the Hibaku Shah. So again, I'd like to say a big thank you to Shigeko Sasamori. <laughs> as well as the other Hibaku Shah uh, who are with us this evening, Kaz and Kiki. And, to, and that extends to all Hibakusha from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, wherever they may be. We share in the passion, commitment, and hope of, that you bring to us by your activities, by your efforts, by your words, by your belief, by your uh, never-ending commitment to ending the nuclear weapons threat to humanity. Now, it's my honor, my privilege, to introduce Mayor Tadatoshi Akiba. He, hold, he holds a PhD degree in mathematics. He was a professor of mathematics at Tufts University and had some other assignments that brought him to the United States and kept him here for nearly 20 years. He also, during his time at Tufts, started a program to bring, to send American journalists to Hiroshima to learn the stories of Hibakusha and spread them uh, throughout the world. Um, after being a professor at Tufts, he returned to Japan where he became a professor of humanities 
at Hiroshima Shudo University. In 1990, he was elected to the Japanese Diet, which is the equivalent of the Japanese House of Repres our House of Representatives, and he served there for nine years until he was elected mayor of Hiroshima uh, in 1999, and he served for 12 years as the mayor of Hiroshima until earlier this year. In that capacity as mayor of Hiroshima, he had uh, responsibility for the city of Hiroshima and also for 10,000 city workers in Hiroshima. In the capacity of um, mayor of Hiroshima, he also served as the president of Mayors for Peace. Mayors for Peace is an international organization uh, of mayors uh, throughout the world. In um, Mayor Akiba uh, expanded Mayors for Peace during his presidency from 440 mayors to nearly 5,000 mayors throughout the world. And one of those mayors is with us tonight, and she represents Santa Barbara, and that's Mayor Helene Schneider. Yeah. Mayor Akiba, uh, his leadership uh, led to the 2020 vision campaign calling for the total abolition of nuclear weapons by the year 2020. I, I think they believe and I join them in that belief that, that a, a campaign to eliminate nuclear weapons by the year 2020 would represent perfect vision. Wow. <laughs> he led a second campaign uh, called Cities Are Not Targets. And uh, the idea of that, it was a petition campaign and the idea of that campaign was that you may not target cities, which of course are exactly what nuclear weapons do, they target cities, but you may not target cities, you may not target children. So that's a second major project of Mayors for Peace. <laughs> Mayor Akiba has been the recipient of many awards, including the Ramon Magsaysay Award also known as the Asian Nobel Prize. I have known Mayor Akiba since shortly after he became mayor. I have admired his energy, his eloquence, and his leadership. He is an honorable man who is dedicated to eliminating the nuclear weapons threat to humanity and all life. So, on behalf of the directors, members, and staff of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, I am very pleased to present our 2011 Distinguished Peace Leadership Award to Mayor Taratoshi Akiba for his sustained efforts on behalf of the Hibakusha and on behalf of humanity, Mayor Akiba. Thank you very much, David, for your kind introduction. And um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Shigeko Sasamori and uh, Sue Kazuishi and Kei Otake. Um, well, actually, she wrote a book um, under that name. So, um, and I would like to thank you together with all of you for their work and for their lives. Um, Mayor Helen Schneider, a fellow member of Mayors for Peace, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my uh, tremendous honor and pleasure to be here in Santa, Santa Barbara and to be recognized this way by the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation 
and all of you, you know, who are present here tonight. And I would like to thank David especially for what he has accomplished as one of the most dedicated uh, peace leaders in the world who have worked tirelessly, energetically, uh, gently, and peacefully to read the world of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Professor Cornell West, a philosopher at the Princeton University, describes what a true leader ought to be. And there are two things uh, he emphasizes especially. One is that in order for us to change the world, the leader should not you know, work, recycle the old uh, frameworks of reality. You know, he'll have to have the courage to break out of that old framework, that's one. But more importantly, a good leader should be able to draw the better natures of our, uh, bet, better angels of our nature. And both of these qualities really fit David perfectly. Also, I should add, President Nixon, well, his um, accomplishments aside, uh, some people have uh, very good opinions of him, others uh, somewhat less, but he, it was an, an extremely good analyst you know, about uh, leaders and politicians. And one quality that he emphasized during the 1988 uh, presidential campaign um, for, for a leader to have is that a good leader has to be a poet. And actually at that point, he described Jesse Jackson as a poet. <laughs> <clears throat> and I agree, and uh, David Krieger is also a poet and I'm really fond of his many, many uh, significant uh, poems uh, from the poetic point of view, and of course, but from uh, political messages that uh, he uh, puts into the poem. So I hope that, um, David, I'd like to say thank you, and I hope you'll continue to be a strong leader just among all of us, and I hope that um, I'll be able to join hands with you you know, to create a better future. So thank you. <clears throat> I would also like to thank all of you here for your concern you know, about the Eastern Japan earthquakes and tsunami and also the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident. The words of um, condolences, sympathy, encouragement, prayer, um, as well as praise you know, for the behaviors of those people who were so badly afflicted um, came to Japan and reached us and we are very grateful you know, for your helping hands and kind and warm words. And I, I would like to you know, again join with all of you to promise to these people that we will do everything in our power so that their lives will be brought to um, normalcy as soon as possible and also to uh, take this occasion, make this occasion a monumental one in shaping a better future for all of us uh, from the point of view of uh, energy, from the point of view of environment and of course from the point of view of creating a sustainable sort of peace for all of us. And Hiroshima does understand, you know, what people are going through in the eastern part of Japan, because Hiroshima had its own experience 66 years ago. And Hiroshima also offers hope to many people because the citizens and Hibakusha were able to reconstruct the city to become one of the most attractive and most vibrant, most beautiful cities in the world today. And 
And of course, we had the outside help. And for example, Norman Cousins, who was the editor of the Saturday Review of Literature at that point, created many wonderful programs to put us on foot again. And uh, Shigeko Sasamori, who is associated with the Cousins family, can tell you uh, in more detail what uh, he has done. But what I'd like to uh, focus on tonight is the activities of the Hibaksha themselves. And I would like to point out three important footsteps that these Hibaksha have left for us. And I mentioned this in the Peace Declaration of 1999. And if you would like to read sort of in more detail uh, what they are, I hope you will look it up in the, in the website um, of Peace Culture Foundation in the city of Hiroshima. The first step, first footstep that the Hibakusha left for us is the fact that under circumstances in which no one would have or could have blamed them had they chosen death, they actually chose life. And they continue to be human, decent human beings since. It is important to realize that, you know, because there are eyewitness accounts, eyewitness accounts that the Hibaksha, after having gained their full consciousness, uh, took their own lives. And so the common sense really did not prevail just after the bombing in 1945. And therefore, it required courage and the will for the Hibaksha just to live. And um, I would like to you know, thank these Hibaksha who had the courage, who had the will to continue to live. And the second footstep they left is the fact that the third nuclear weapon has, been, has not been used. They told their stories, which they would rather forget to the rest of the world, and as a result, a third nuclear weapon has not been utilized um, while we are alive. And actually, this is exactly what uh, John Hersey, who wrote the book Hiroshima after interviewing six Hibakusha in 1946, said on his second visit to Hiroshima in 1985. I actually directly talked with him, and that's exactly what he told me. So what that means is that the deterrence of nuclear weapons is not nuclear weapons. Deterrence to nuclear weapons is the Hibaksha themselves. <laughs> and their determination to read the world of nuclear you know, weapons should be respected. And therefore, we should make further efforts to get rid of nuclear weapons while Hibaksha are alive. But at the same time, I think for ourselves, it is important that we accomplish that goal. Because if the deterrence is gone, not the nuclear weapons, but the Hibaksha, then those forces who really would like to use nuclear weapons certainly will do so. And that would be would be the doom for all of us. So it is very important to understand the time limit we have. There isn't much, but 2020 is a good goal you know, for us to accomplish that. Um, and as a matter of fact, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon echoed our wishes when he visited Hiroshima last year on August 6th. He was the first UN Secretary General who came to Hiroshima to attend the ceremony, but uh, he declared as follows. I, I pledge to gather together with all of you and together with Hibaksha on the 75th anniversary of the bombing to celebrate the end of nuclear weapons. So the United Nations is with us. And, in, well, in passing, I should mention that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon also called the 2020 vision 
a perfect vision. So there is something common between Ban Ki-moon and David Krieger. <laughs> I'm glad to report. And um, so 2020 vision, uh, which has a midterm goal of creating a nuclear weapons convention by 2015. Um, will be, you know, pursued further by the mayors around the world. And that mayors for peace accidentally was created in 1982, the same year the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation was created. And that's by coincidence. And by coincidence, David Krieger and I are born in 1942. Sorry, David, I'm not sure whether you wanted me to say this or not. <laughs> but, um, and um, as of o October 1st, the membership count of Mayors of Peace is 5,020, 5,020, <laughs> which is one-tenth of the membership of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. <laughs> but um, in total, if, you, if we add up all the populations of these cities, it is one billion people. And it is a sizable representation in the international arena. And further than that, President Obama joined us, the majority of the people in the world, when he declared in Prague that it is the moral responsibility of President Obama and the United States to pursue a nuclear weapon-free world. And as a matter of fact, we are the majority. And despite the fact that um, in many people's minds, you know, we are simply a marginalized group of people, but we are the majority. Let me give you just one number. There is an important treaty called the Nuclear Weapon F Free uh, Zone Treaty. And uh, in, in total, there are six treaties of this kind that encompasses, as a matter of fact, 100 and 19 countries out of 192 uh, members of the United Nations. That's a clear majority. And the clear majority of the countries are so um, strong-willed as to sign treaties, bind themselves uh, to this commitment. Okay, so that's, that's a clear majority. But Countries consist of many people, and therefore, when we count those countries you know, which have not signed uh, such treaties yet, the clear majority, if I add up the poll numbers around the world, country by country, we are the clear majority in the world. <clears throat> and Thanks to um, David, I can report that I have learned from your column recently that um, 25 years ago, almost exactly five, 25 years ago, Reagan Gorbachev meeting was held in Reykjavik. And not too many people are aware of the importance of that meeting, but we came within an inch to a nuclear weapon free world then. And so for those people who have any doubts that we can accomplish this by 2020, I want to point out, in 1986 already, we are very close to it. And all we need is another push to make that a reality. <clears throat> and I'd like to say for pessimists that who predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. Who predicted that President Lincoln would issue the Emancipation Proclamation in 1960? Oh, sorry, 1860. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course he couldn't do it in 1916. And what about Excel, you know, the, the software? Well, actually, 10, well, tw 30 years ago, I inquired you know, whether anybody had that software, that kind of software. I was hired as a consult business consultant. And they said, no, 
you know, just we are far behind. It'll take probably 50 years before we come up with it. <laughs> but look what we have. And also, speaking of computers, um, look at what we have. iPad 2, iPhone 5, which will come very soon. But 30 years ago, nobody dreamt that we'd have these things. So it's the dream that we should really take seriously. A goal is our dream with a deadline. And therefore, 2020 vision you know, has a clear goal. And in addition, what I wish I could show you the, the PowerPoint, but the growth rate of mayor's OPs has a curve, exponential curve. And it doubles, it overlaps with the growth curve of the production of transistors in the world. So if you believe that computers and the internet will continue to grow, you'd better believe that Mayors for Peace and the people who are working to abolish nuclear weapons will also grow exponentially to reach a goal. And I would like to mention at this point why cities and why mayors. One reason is history. World history consists of many tragedies, but when you think about it, most of them bear the names of cities. Guernica, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and the list goes on. Because although we are taught in schools that nation states are the frameworks in which we should you know, treat important matters for humanity. But it is actually the cities, neighborhoods, well, and uh, start to start with families. You know, that are the receptacle, that are the right you know, size of uh, compassion and also sympathy and grieving and remembering and determined not to repeat those sufferings again. That's the right you know, kind, kind of um, size. You know, it's the cities that, does that do remember. And let me just give you one example. There is a city called Ypres, Belgium, which was um, known for the first use of chemical weapons during World War I. Now, right now, more than 90 years after the end of World War I, that city, Ypres, still holds ceremonies every evening to console the souls of the war dead. That's how cities do remember. That's how Hiroshima remembers, Nagasaki remembers, and all the other cities that have joined Miyazaki Peace remember. So that's history is one part. Another part is cities are where people actually live. Their daily lives are spent in their families, in their neighborhoods, but in the, in the cities. And that's very, very important. The fact that the Hiroshima um, Hibakusha's message that no one else should ever suffer as we did, and um, the important part being that no one includes literally everyone, including those whom you would normally label as enemies, Okay, that message is so strong and universal because ba that's based on the lives, everyday lives, of the Hibaksha. And that strength actually comes from the diversity of cities. Cities diverse because there are so many people with different religion, different occupations, uh, different income levels, and different uh, political persuasions, and many more. But because they live within a confined space and time and neighborhood, and because they have to get along with each other, and they have the wisdom, we human beings do have the wisdom to create a common future you know, when you live together at an, at an everyday you know, life level. And that is why diversity and tolerance within the city you know, create a great civilization great economy and great people and the great future. So it's the diversity and tolerance of the cities that give us you know, hope. And 
as you know, internet and the citizens are changing the world. When you look at in various places where the internet has been used for the first time to show people what reality is, then people are saying that we want a better future. The same thing will happen when it comes to the survival of the human race. And together, as President Obama said, we can accomplish that goal. I, I would like to list at the end what progress we have made you know, toward a world without nuclear weapons. Some people say that it's too slow, and I join them because the average age of Hibakusha is now 77. Many people, well, although they really wanted to continue, decided not to, telling, not to tell their stories anymore because of their health. And so um, I wish we can hasten the pace, but still and yet we should really take pride in what we, the humanity, you know, so far have accomplished. Let me read the list. In 1963, there was the Partial Test Ban Treaty. All the atmospheric um, testing was terminated. In 1970, seven years later, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed. All the governments in the world, you know, by that treaty, are supposed to sit at the table to negotiate in good faith and come to a conclusion about nuclear disarmament. And that's basically saying that the world should get rid of nuclear weapons. That was back in 1970. In 1972, two years later, chemical weapons were banned. In 1982, in New York City, I'm sure many of you were there, there was a big rally, massive rally and demonstration calling for the nuclear freeze which was you know, such a grand occasion, and that started you know, many, many activities around the world you know, for that goal, and that goal still, that efforts, efforts still continuing. In 1986, there was the Reagan-Gorbachev meeting, and in 1992, biological weapons were banned. In 1998, six years later, anti-personal landmine treaty was signed, and this was the creation of the people. We created it. And in 2008, cluster munitions were banned also. Again, this was done by the initiative of the people and NGOs around the world and like-minded governments. So with this history, in the background, with your efforts, with our efforts, it is possible that we can accomplish the Nuclear Weapons Convention, which will ban all nuclear weapons by 2015. And based on that uh, treaty, we will be able to, together with Ban Ki-moon, celebrate the end of nuclear weapons by 2020. So let's pull our energy together, efforts together, so that uh, we can actually ce celebrate that occasion. So I hope you'll join each other and uh, let us work uh, even harder you know, for that goal. Thank you very much, and I would like to end my speech by saying, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>